Good evening and welcome to the BS and Beer Show, where we spread BS and have fun doing it. BS stands for Building Science, of course. Uh, my name is Mike Maines. I'm a designer in Maine. Uh, tonight, I am drinking for my the beer portion. I'm drinking a Rising Tide Zephyr India Pale Ale, local brew, very tasty. I love my IPAs. I know not everyone does. Uh, tonight's topic is uh, part two of our window series. Um, we may only have two. I don't know. Maybe we'll have more. Tonight we're talking about window installation details. Our guests tonight are Jake Bruton and Steve Bazek. Uh, they, these two gentlemen need no introduction, um, but Emily will probably say a few words anyway. Um, at, the <laughs> at, the, uh, at the BS and Beer show, we encourage local BS in beer groups, um, we have the, there, are, there, are, there are independent groups scattered around the country and world now, so you should start your own to talk about local building science issues. Um, if you want to join our mailing list, there's an email link to sign up and also to review to view recorded shows at bbsandbeershow.com. Um, you can also get there through Green, Green Building Advisor. Uh, and we'd like to thank our media partners, Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine. I will turn it over to Brian. Yeah, hey everyone, Brian Pontalillo from Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor. Um, looking forward to part two on Windows. Uh, we had a, if you, if you didn't see part one, it was two weeks ago, I think. And so check that out on YouTube or, or GBA. Um, it, not that you needed, it, it's not a sequel. You didn't need to see part one to come to part two. So if you didn't see part one, stick with us. Um, so we're going to have the, the usual format tonight. Um, we're going to start with a, a presentation from uh, Steve. Uh, then we'll, we'll get into some discussion amongst the, our two panelists and the hosts. And we will, along the way, take, um, take questions from anyone who's listening. Use the chat box for that. So if you haven't found the chat box yet, um, if you haven't used Zoom at this point, I would be surprised. But Maybe there are some newbies. So if you haven't found the chat box yet, there's a little icon at the bottom of the screen that says chat, just click on it, it'll pop up. You can position it wherever you'd like. And then when you use the chat box, make sure you select all panelists and attendees in the drop down if you want everyone to see um, what you're writing. If you'd like to message someone privately, you can do that too. But if you want us to see your questions, you have to select all panelists and attendees. And um, I'm, I'm drinking homemade. Um, kombucha, as usual, orange ginger. And I think that's it for me tonight. So I will pass it over to Emily. Hey guys, uh, Emily Mottram. I'm an architect here in Maine. Um, tonight it's BS and bourbon. So for all of those bourbon drinkers who, who tune in, uh, there's no beer. So um, actually that's a lie. There's Mick Ultra and I won't drink that. So um, <laughs> so it's, it's bourbon tonight. Uh, for, for me. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our guests, although as Mike said, these guys don't really need an introduction, but I'll give you a little quick update. Uh, Jake is a builder and remodeler in Columbia, Missouri, so not in the New England area. Woo! Go us. Um, <laughs> He owns Arrow Building um, for more than a decade. He brings his education in art and energy efficient, durable and architecturally significant homes. So he's gonna go through a bunch of uh, details tonight with Steve on Windows. So we get to hear firsthand um, what he's doing there. You can also find both Jake and Steve on the Build Show Network and their podcast, the Unbuild It podcast. So make sure you guys check that out. Jake, is there anything you'd like to say about yourself that I didn't say? I don't think so. I, I am happy to be here and I'm drinking water tonight because I think I'm going to go back to work after this. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> personal house. Working on my personal house. It doesn't count as work. And we have Steve Bazek. Uh, Steve's an architect, nationally recognized, uh, designing, developing custom residential structures for over 26 years. Um, he has a really long line of things that prove his certification, including uh, working for Building Science Corporation um, and some of the nation's top energy conscious homes. Um, you can find him also on the Build Show Network and the Unbuild It podcast. And both of them are fairly active on Instagram. So throw your Instagram handles uh, in the chat box for anybody who doesn't already follow the two of you. Um, his commitment 
simply equates to aesthetics and durability with high performance. Um, and some of my favorite details are, uh, I think you call it big red, Steve, uh, yes, where, where, you, where you follow around uh, all the details with your red Sharpie marker. So um, anything else you'd like to say about yourself? Um, no, I think, uh, you know, we could just get started and uh, we'll not, uh, we can just get started and talk about Windows. I love talking about work, so. All right, so before we get started on that, uh, we're going to throw it over to Travis to give some announcements tonight. Yeah, if you guys saw in Instagram this week, I put out a request for people who are doing building science events throughout the week to uh, send those to me and I'll include them in the announcements for the upcoming week. I did not get any of those DMs or messages from anyone else, so I'm going to announce my own stuff. Uh, I'll announce that we are uh, still looking forward to doing book club, uh, probably going to discuss the new carbon architecture, Bruce King's excellent book, uh, coming up September 24th, I think is our tentative discussion date. So you have plenty of time to order the book and read it, uh, or you can borrow Jake's. So if you, uh, if you don't want to read it or you can't read, Jake can't either, he can loan you his. We should be good to go on that front. Less pictures than what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I also have another event to announce, uh, which you're gonna see probably a lot of from me, and maybe from the other two guys on the screen there, Jake and Steve have generously agreed to come to Kansas City on September 16th for the Midwest, the first annual Midwest Building Science. I still Post. can't believe it. <laughs> One mistake after another from you, bud. Uh, too generous with your time. Uh, at any rate, it's going to be at Boulevard Brewing, so it will be a BS and beer event. It is open bar, and uh, Huber is generously paying the tab on that. So. Uh, along with a lot of other great sponsors like Rockwell and Sash Co. Uh, we're just, we're excited to have these guys come and talk about the control layers on September 16th. If you want the link to that, you can track me down for it, uh, or it's at bsnbeerkc.org. And now I would love to hear from Steve about how I should be installing my windows, because I'm sure I'd be making lots of mistakes. First of all, I got to make a recommendation to Armando. Both he and I should be more concerned about a treadmill, not barbecue. Um, only because I love them so much. But uh, I don't know how you want to do this, Brian. I, I have my screen set up so I can, or who's ever in charge, Mike. You should be able to share your screen, Steve. You got it, buddy. Share screen. And we're going to share that one. I'm assuming you can see that. Yes. It's on the, it's not on the slideshow mode though, so we can see the next slide. Oh, all right. Stand by. I got this real fancy setup here where. This is my favorite part of every presentation. This is where you feel clever banter, Jake. Oh, <laughs> uh, there we go. Right. You got that? All right, everybody. So welcome for, <clears throat> I will, I will talk a little introduction. Um, so as, as Mike said, I worked for building science corporation for almost 10 years. Um, and then as an architect on my own after that, um, so third, almost 30 years now. And, uh, at building science corporation, I got to do a lot of great things as a young architect. One of them was take buildings apart and learn from other people's mistakes which was huge. And two was we got to do a bunch of tests every now and then. And one of the tests that I did with uh, Peter Yo's brother, Nathan, and a bunch of uh, manufacturers across the country is for almost two years, we traveled around the country installing windows and then testing them to, to see if they leaked and if they did leak, how did they leak, et cetera, et cetera. And so I compiled a whole bunch of knowledge just doing that and getting a really good understanding about windows. And so this first slide is kind of the, the basic premise to, you know, Joe's comment of all windows leak. And when I speak of Joe, that's Joe Stebrick. For those of you, I, I'm assuming everybody knows when I say Joe, but for those that don't, I'm, I'm referring to Joe from Building Science Corporation. But Joe would always commonly be heard saying all windows leak. And my retort to Joe was always, well, only the ones I let see water. 
So this is a project of mine. I showed up one day and lo and behold, it was the perfect picture taking opportunity. So, you know, when you look at windows leaking, when we did that uh, leaking test for two years, most of the windows failed at the head of the window. They very rarely fail at the jam and sometimes they fail at the sill, but most of the time it's a challenge at the head flashing and how, how we try and push water out and over the window. So this is a really great slide, I think, in saying that, you know, you, you could do the modern houses with the parapet and the windows are in the wall and that's fine if you detail them properly. But if you want a really good insurance policy against mother nature, there's no better insurance policy than having a good roof overhang. So I think that's probably why we put roof hangs, roof overhangs on houses. There you go. All right. So second slide, there's, there's basically, I, I would, I always label it as three ways to install a window. There's what I call a water managed system or what the industry would call a water managed system. There's what I would call a face sealed system. And then there's what I call the hybrid system, which is somewhere in between the two. And I never do a face sealed system. I think you're pretty naive if you think you're gonna battle mother nature for a hundred years with a face sealed system and tape all four sides of the flange um, with like an ice and water shield or an impermeable tape and let that moisture, you know, you're just gonna keep it out. And I see it all the time here in New England. I see people putting windows, you know, oceanfront properties, they put up the, the window with a flange and then they put Vicor on four sides of the window, all four sides. And I just can't wait for a couple of years to watch how that fails. Um, but the more importantly, the, the other two systems, I'm not gonna talk about that one cause I don't do it. I don't have examples of it. I think it's a bad idea. The Water managed system. So the water managed system suggests that if water gets into the system, we find a real nice, easy path for it to get out. And Joe's favorite words would be down and out. And um, so here, there's a couple photos. You can see me, that's me in the bottom left-hand corner. So one of the things that was a huge asset to me is being able to go out to the job site and actually install some windows, right? And it's it's really interesting because they're, they might even be in the crowd here tonight, but I won't embarrass them by name. But I had, a, I had one project where, you know, people say, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that. The building industry is filled with Monday morning quarterbacks the minute you post a detail somewhere. And so I had a couple of people that said, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that. And it just so happens that a few months later, they were out at a project of mine and they were, they're both in the building industry and we we're putting in windows. And I said, Hey guys, you know, you guys always criticize, you know, when I post something, tell me I should do this or that. Well, here's a great opportunity for me to learn from you. So here's the window, there's the flashing, there's the tape, there's all this stuff. Why don't you guys install the window? And they looked at me like, you want us to put the window in? I said, yeah, what a great opportunity. Great learning experience for me to learn from you guys. And it, it took them, a, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half before the builder and I took over and said, okay, you guys are done. And then we really installed the window. But the, the reality is, is there's, there's a ton of opinions about this stuff. There's a lot of ways that you can do it. There's even a handful of ways that you can do it successfully. Um, one of the things, like I said, I go out onto the job site. I like to install it. I like to understand how my details come to life. And so again, me in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, when I go out there, I don't go out there by myself. That particular day, I had the zip rep out there. We had the window rep out there. We had the general contractor out there. The guys that were installing the windows were out there. They were all out there. And we installed one window that will run through the steps here. But at the conclusion of that one window, I looked at the crowd and said, okay, does everybody agree with the way we installed that window? And it was a general consensus of yes. Then I just looked at the builder and said, okay, the next 38, just do like that one. And we're all on the same page. But that way there, everybody kind of has a buy-in and has a knowledge and an understanding as well as an opportunity to question anything that we're doing out there or any piece of the window. So Moving on through the window, and Jake, can you see my arrow when I move it? Yes, I can. Okay, 
So here we have an apron here, and that's just because this is an open rain screen system and we wanted to have black. But basically this sill flashing could have turned over and just went on top of the zip if it was, say, a regular closed cladding system. Um, and you can see that here. Basically what we're doing is just basically sealing up the butt ends of the R6 insulation panel that we have on the wall there. The next step would be that we put it in the back dam and then we put in a slope sill. We covered that here in stretch tape and you can see these guys did a beautiful job. Um, and I knew we were taking the picture. So yes, I did stage it. So we had stretch tape right there. Obviously it did make a nice pretty picture, but um, <laughs> lo and behold, here's our down and out, right? We have a back dam, we have a slope sill and this will spill into a rain screen opening. You can see it there, all finished. We wrap the jams, we back caulk or back seal the jams in the head, shim the windows, not a whole lot of magic. I mean, a lot of you, I would assume are pretty well aware of this. Steve, how tall is the back dam there? Are we talking a piece of three quarter with a yeah, piece of cedar a, siding a in front? Yeah, a piece of three quarter, but I've done it with half inch plywood. All you really need is a leading edge because you're gonna seal there, you know, there or just inside of the back dam. And so you just need something that stops the momentum of any water that might get pushed up there. And the sloping sill is certainly a benefit because we have that down and out working for us in our favor there. So here you have the window, the window gets installed, plumb, square, all of that good stuff. We tape the jams, we tape the head and there is our water managed system and we have the ability to bleed any water out of here. Now, I don't personally go in there and put in little wedges or something. I know there's some people, some guys will use a, I've seen a six penny finish nail. They'll put it up under there when they screw in the bottom of the flange there just to create a little air space. I don't do that, I just leave it. Um, but, we uh, do uh, two beads, two vertical beads of the sealant that we're putting behind the flange as a spacer, or uh, we run in two of those screws that we're using to install the windows anyway. So we right. just put them in prior to, and then we didn't have to remember to buy shims. Okay. So that's what I call a water managed system. Why is it water managed? Because if anything does get into the system, there is a valve to let that water out down underneath here, under that leading edge of the, the pan. Um, moving on. So this one is what I call the hybrid system. And the hybrid system I usually use when I do flangeless windows and um, what you call it in European style. And usually those are in deeper weld windows. You can see here, this is in a 12 inch double wall frame here. And we have a piece of five quarter installed here, basically doing that same back dam that we talked about. Um, for the luxury of the photo, I just grabbed a couple pieces here to show the intermittent break, but basically you can see the down and out slope nothing more than a piece of uh, cedar clapboard. And then here we used Exto Seal, which is the European version of zip stretch tape. This also has an open joint cladding, so we have the building paper apron under here. But you notice we have the slope sill, we have the back dam, that folds over into the face of the apron. We'll have our uh, rain screen here, so it's a drainable system. Steve, when we were uh, doing a presentation for fine home building in uh, at IBS this year, Ben Bogie and I asked for cedar clabbered for the sill of our opening and they couldn't find any. And uh, I would like to point out that that's one more thing in my market that I can't get. And so very rarely do we use it. We actually just slope the framing. Yep, a lot of guys will cut the cripples to like a five degree slope and they'll just put the um, rough sill in at a slight slope. And the I mean, biggest problem there is if we're talking about, if you go back one, that wall is very difficult to cut that wall on a five degree pitch and not have a lot of 
carpentry math issues going on with how high the inside is versus how high, how low the outside is. And so I think if we're building a wall that's in the 12 inch range, we may even split the sill and have uh, a compound cut on the sill. And, and I don't know how, I mean, I don't know exactly how well it would work, but you could do something like quarter inch plywood, cut a one inch strip, nail it down across the back and then put the one or a quarter inch plywood over the top of it. Yeah. And, and get a slope like that. So I, I, I mean, there's a lot of ways here. And, and like I said, there, there's a handful of ways to be successful here. I see people say, Oh, it's better to slope the, the rough sill. The, the important thing that I care about is that where we adhere to the down and out um, ideology, right? That yep. we want to move water down and out how we do it. I really don't give a damn how we uh, approach that but just make sure that it does that. Um, so that being said, we wrap the windows and then install the window inside. These are Shuko um, UPVC windows. So for my good friends at European Architectural <clears throat> Supply, I'll throw Patrick a little plug there. That's a good plug, um, he's listening. I know. And then, and then we air seal the tape on the outside here where we basically connect this tape to the face frame and the bite on the face frame is probably about a quarter of an inch. It's not, not a whole lot there. Um, and you can see this is the, the fully installed window. And the reason I said this is a hybrid is we even tape the bottom. We do use a, a more permeable tape down there. That's more vapor open than the inside tape. So that if there was some moisture in there, it has the ability to dry out. It's going to dry out very slowly. But the reason I feel comfortable with the hybrid system in these walls is this reason here, right? Because this for water to get in here to really make this window leak, I have to fail miserably up here and not kick that water out. Flange windows, that flange is right there. And having the flange detailed properly and having the face of the window basically in the same plane as the side or sheathing really scares me or in, in, in the same plane as the drainage plane itself. That scares me. So because it's flangeless and I have the ability to recess it, personally, I don't have a problem doing the hybrid system here. And I've, I'd have tons of houses literally probably more than a thousand windows and none of them have leaked. Um, that, you know Jake's gonna, that I know of, I know. I was waiting for that to come. I know. Um, but anyways, like I said, it's a personal preference. That's how I do it. That's how I like to do it. Now, that being said, Jake and I are about to embark on a project. We do, you know, at least one or two projects a year together. And the next project, we are going to eliminate that tape at the bottom, move it, move the European window to a fully water managed system and seal it on the inside. So we have new details where we're developing to get to that. So the next time uh, BS and beer gives me the privilege to be here, I'll show you those details. Someone murdering your dogs, Steve? No, they're locked up and they, they're dying to come see me because I haven't been home all day. So, and everybody else is gone. So, but thanks for pointing that out. They haven't seen the presentation yet. They haven't seen the presentation. Uh, so, so this one here, now I put this in because a lot of people sit there and say, oh, you need to over insulate the frame. Well, I did it on this house. I will never argue for that again. Now, you guys can throw up all your, all your chats. Yes, Russ, that's Ducky. Um, you guys can throw up all your chat comments and say, oh, you need to do it. The frame's the worst part of the window. But here, let me clue you in on how I think something has to be the worst part of the house. And if it's the window frame, I'm good with that. It's and a small portion. It's a small portion. And let's run through the numbers because I know you all love numbers. I asked the builder on this particular house what the cost to put one inch of XPS around the inside and run it on the window frame. He said he would have estimated it somewhere around 60 to 75 bucks a window. So at 35 windows, you do the math. What's that? Help me out, Jake, while I keep talking. But it starts with a nine. 35 windows there. So it's a thousand bucks. This house is owned by a retired mechanical engineer that has more 
spreadsheets on performance than anything I know. And he ran the numbers with or without that foam there. And it totaled, it moved the needle on his passive house about eight to $9 a year. So a thousand dollars worth of over insulating the frame versus a savings of about eight to $9 a year. Keep in mind, this house is a 2,600 square foot house. It, uh, it's average um, it monthly bill before we took it to zero energy was about $95 a month for heating, cooling, hot water, um, and plug load. Um, now he's totaled zero plus. But the other thing is, is we cut grooves in this one. I actually have a house that we did. We didn't cut the grooves in. And right in back here, it acted like a dam. And this filled up with water. And we actually had a couple of windows. We were very fortunate that the windows leaked during construction and not when we were done because all the trim inside was all white oak. And it was a, a very nice interior. But we were able to understand that. And then the builder had to go out and rip out all of the insulation at the sill and redo the outside. So... I know a lot this of people like this. I know it's controversial, but I will never do this again. But this one is performing well because this house is what eight years old, six yes. six years old, and it's coastal. And it's it's yeah, it's coastal. It's it's with certainly within a mile of the ocean. Um, and those grooves, I'm sure, do help it. Um, and you can see here that we did take the time to shim on top, so we get air all around the system. <clears throat> so that it can bleed out. But I, again, I, I, I said my piece. You guys can take it for what it's worth. Um, these I just threw in. You know, when you're dealing with deep windows, you can see here we have that kind of drippable or drip with the uh, open joint rain screen here. We actually have a small joint behind here so that the rain screen can bleed out and go down to the sill and drop out. Um, this is one of my favorite details here for thick walls. This is the 14 inch wall that Michael Maines condemned me on um, with the truss on the outside because I didn't use cellulose. Sorry. But, but this is how we solved those windows. We did a nice, you know, uh, low pitch. We did a copper sill there, brought it back. The windows are inside. And if you notice here, we have a rain screen detail where we bleed the moisture out from our rain screen at that level. So again, that's why I feel comfortable doing the hybrid system, as I call it. I also think that the picture on the right there, Steve, points out the idea of uh, location of the window in the wall. And if we push it to the if we push it back in a little, it gets a little roof. And if you were to consider this thing to just be, you know, if the window was the full height of that copper and window together and yep. two inches back, you can see where that copper is staining and how little water is getting up and onto that. Yeah. And how protected yeah. your window would be if it's just two inches back in the wall. It's very weathered here and absolutely, you know, it's, it's near shiny penny up here still. And what's interesting, I was just there at this house, we're doing another project, but next time I go down, I'll have to take some pictures to see like what the weather pattern is on this board up here, you know, or these upper boards here. So, but anyway, yes. Um, yeah, Dan, um, we've done shingle returns too. <laughs> they, they, you know, as you can see here, obviously, but yes, ton of work, ton of work, but man, they look good. All right, so another controversy that I love, I love stirring the pot here. That's what Travis told me to do. He pays me a lot of money to stir the pot. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about shading. So those are my two systems to install windows. Let's talk about where, where you put the windows and how do you cover it. And it, this is very interesting because in my travels, when I talk about shading a window, people say, oh, just put big roof overhangs on okay here's here's my <clears throat> answer to that roof overhangs don't provide proper shading yes you heard me say it they don't provide proper shading because if you believe they do i'm going to come back at you and say what date of the year do you design the overhang for and when i ask that in a crowd of people 
a bunch of hands go up and say, oh, this is easy. June 21st is when the sun is highest, right? Okay, I agree with that. But then I ask them again, what's the hottest day of the year? Not June 21st. Not June 21st. Probably a couple months later, right? In August. So if we design the shading device for August 15th, then it's not going to work very effectively, right? Or it would have to be a four or five foot overhang to shade a window like this. So this was done in SketchUp. I built a model of the house. I actually built the exact louver system that we were using on this house. And it has that 14 inch deep overhang. And as you can see, we tested it at May 15th, June 15th. And I did have the right longitude in, right? Where you were able to geographically locate this model. You can see July 15th there. And then August 15th, you can see that sill is starting to creep. So we were able, because of the 14 inch depth there and the 25 inch overhang here, we were able to tune that in right to the bottom of those windows for shading. And then you're gonna ask, well, what happens after August? Well, this is all removable. So Farley goes out there, there's two hitch pins down here, a hitch pin up here, and these just lift off. If you don't follow me on Instagram, I just did a post about this with the hardware that we used a couple weeks ago. And then you're able to remove them, and then you get the benefit of Mother Nature to heat your house on the months that you do need to heat it on. There's a shot of it in action. Yes, power awnings, someone, Timothy Lacey said power awnings. Power awnings are definitely the way to go. And I'm going to show you a fine example of that here in a bit. I think the one we're looking at right now works because it's a builder's house. Well, this one works. It's his own it's, home. It's his own home and he cares about it. Although I do have some other examples of projects that we've done for homeowners where, and they've been diligent about removing the louvers. And those are actually even an easier system, so... Um, Those now, are aesthetically nice. Couldn't you just fold them up against the house? Couldn't they lay flat and still be could. a pretty feature? The, the, the problem is, is when you search for this hardware, Travis, it's, there's not a ton of it out there. And for those of you that are looking for something like this, this is Bahama shutter hardware. You know, in the Bahamas, they have the louvers that basically fold out like an awning. That's what this hardware is actually made for. Um, and it is adjustable. You can see it's adjustable right there. So you can get, get it all to work for you. Um, but aside from making something custom, Travis, this becomes a little bit of a challenge getting it right and all of that good stuff. So <laughs> the next one here, <clears throat> there's a couple things that we did here. One, I just, I threw this in, I wanted to show you because these are tilt turn windows and this falls in about seven inches, if we built out this wall to here, you wouldn't have the ability to put interior shades in unless you built a, out some type of valance. So because we have the double wall here, we actually built a five inch pocket above all these windows that the homeowner wasn't sure they wanted to put in shading devices, but if they did, then we could put a valance across here that's flush and have a space for that in there. Uh, this system here, this is probably one of the better systems. So this has a little roof overhang and in the next picture you'll see it a little clearer, but it's basically a roll down shade that sits on these tracks and we put the cassette up inside that ceiling system of this little canopy roof. And on and the exterior side. And it's on the exterior side. Yes. Great point, Jake. If you're putting a shading device on a house, Shading the inside of the window does nothing for overheating because once the heat is through the glass, it's in the room. If you want to shade a room, you need to shade <coughs> it for heating purposes on the outside. So you can see here, um, I have an outdoor picture here where Dan just, this is the retired mechanical engineer. This is a passive house. And because we have this nine foot by 10 foot window arrangement, on the front of the house, we elected to put a screening device here, given that this is his living room. And you can see here, it does about a 50% screening of the window 
this being underneath the screen, this being where the screen is. So it and doesn't the totally is selectable too. You can choose. Yes, you can passages. you can get different gradations of um, having that stuff come through. So. So when we talk about shading like that, even though it's not window installation, if you saw Peter's things I did at my own home post on Unbuild It Podcasts IG this week, uh, I was talking to Peter after he sent that to me and asking some questions. And uh, Peter explained to me that those honeycomb blinds that have the rail on the side uh, in his testing, they figured out that they could get into the like 140 range in between the window and the blind because the coating on the inside of the window is designed to not let things out, but let things in. And so it was UV heating and, and radiating inside that little area and then not being able to escape back out either side, the curtain or the glass. And then Peter looked up that uh, the window manufacturers, the sill gasket around there is rated to like 136. And, and so, also, that, that could work against you on the inside also, Jake, on the winter side. Um, yeah. I had a project a couple of years ago that we did. The, the wife, um, the, well, the husband sent me an email. I called him talking to the wife. She says, Steve, all the windows, I know they're triple glazed. We're getting condensation on the inside. And I was like, what? That, that's not <coughs> happening. So after about five minutes of grilling her with a few questions, we came to understand that she put light blocking shades on the inside. And then she put drapes on the inside the of curtains. that. She ran a humidifier and it was only in the kid's bedroom. So I asked her, what do you guys do different? They close the doors, they run a humidifier, uh, like a little floor mounted one in each of the kids' rooms. They have light blocking shades and drapes on the outside of that. So of course they created this little microclimate and basically froze the window all night long and then blast it with, you know, 60%, 70% RH in the room. Of course, it's going to rain on the inside. So, so you have to be really careful when you, you know, when you're working with those 12, 16 inch thick walls that you can create microclimates in there both ways. You can either cook it or you can freeze it, but you have to be careful with what types of, uh, you know, drapes, curtains, and accessories that you choose to put in there. But you have to have very serious conversations with your clients before you give them the keys. And understand, yeah, they need to understand what the house is doing for them. So um, that concludes the slideshow. Certainly open for questions, discussion. Steve, Steve with, with, with your overhangs, awnings, bristles, whatever you want to call, call it, do you ever put them taller and have them project more so they let in all the winter sun, but still block the summer sun. Do you know what I mean? It's, instead of having to make them removable, um, is or, or or is that something that's easier in the in the north? I guess because our sun angles vary more, maybe. Yeah, it it does, but you still run into the same problem that the sun is at its highest in on June twenty first. That it's it's at its lowest December twenty first, and it doesn't matter. It's that's true for the northern hemisphere. And the problem is, is June 21st is not the hottest day of the year or the day that requires the most shading. And, and understand that the, the shading and the angle of the sun also has to do with what's called thermal lag, right? In June, things aren't 100% heated up. They still have capacity to take on heat. And when Outside you say material, things, you mean... Concrete, Drywall, trees, floor, everything. Everything, right? That's why when you walk on a, across an asphalt driveway in June, even though it's a 90 degree day, it might not be as hot as that asphalt driveway in August. Because um, by the time you get to August, things have been heated up, but the nights haven't been cool enough. So the retention and thermal lag is working against you. And, and so what you're asking for, Mike, is June... 21st has the highest sun August 20 21st for just the example is the hottest day and if I make it for that day then I have to have some pretty massive overhangs that when I go to the winter side of the coin and look at December 21st as being the day where the sun is the lowest 
but the coldest day of the year is February 21st or 15th. So if I design for um, December 21st, then I'm blocking a good portion of the sun by the time we get to mid-February. So, and, and it, the thermal lag is obviously working in reverse, right? The ground is at its coldest in February and surrounding materials, et cetera, and heat loss is at its highest. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't know where it is, I'd, I'd have to look, but there's a gentleman out of Canada and I can't remember his name. He wrote an article on this years ago and I used to have a copy of it readily available. I'll, I'll try and search it out, Mike, or go to the, the guy that sent it to me and ask him if he can send it again. And if I do, then you can put it up on the website. But okay. it's a great article that argues this point that, you know, the, the, the traditional, you know, and, and I'm sure Emily can attest to this, you know, architecture school, we love to do those drawings and show the sun angle June 21st and the sun angle December 21st. And they just aren't valid. Um, I mean, they work and they work for those days, but they don't work for you when you really need it. If you d design it to that day. Right, right. That makes yeah. sense. Definitely not. And um, there's this website and I'll see if I can find the link to it that actually gives you a whole map where you can see what's shaded across the whole year. And so we make our adjustments based on that so that we can kind of figure out based on the hottest days, of, you know, what's, what's the best depth. And that's a better way to take a look at it because you're right. Like the, the highest sun angle, I mean, June 21st, I think it was like 60 degrees in Maine. Um, it's definitely hotter this week. Stop. So. Stop right. <laughs> I know. That's, that's you, probably right. It's 71 degrees here at our latitude of 38. Yeah. So. I mean, I'm not wearing a sweatshirt today, so it's warm. <laughs> well, hey, you, you better go outside and enjoy it. Winter's coming next week. Yeah. We're almost done with road construction season. Uh, we winter. Road could don't get me going. I've driven up on the highway in Maine. That's <laughs> perpetual construction. Nonstop. Um, get, Guys, another question. Uh, Tim L Lacey had uh, he wasn't able to join in tonight, but um, he asked with with windows getting getting larger and larger as just as part of architectural style and with with uh, mulling systems. Are there any changes like the uh, the installation tips you noted? Are those good for any size window? When you get into ten foot by twelve foot windows and things like that, do the rules change? Do structural nulls help or not help? Should they be nulled on site? What do you, you know? What what happens when windows get big, or or what what changes when when windows get big? I guess that's the short way to say it. Gotcha. Um, I mean, my my it's funny because European windows, I don't have a problem. Um, having them mullet, this all came as one unit, the, the big three window. I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen. Yes. Okay. But so this was all one unit and I've done other windows of similar 13, 14 foot width, six foot tall that have mullion systems in it that have never leaked. I don't have a problem with, um, when I do projects with other windows other than Shuko or these are macro in actually, um, I typically tend to have the window and do a site mull, basically, you know, two two by fours or three two by fours, and then do the next window. Um, so I would rather take it upon me with the flashing system in the window than to put it into the window manufacturer. Also, if you're relying on a tape on the outside, it's one more little bump if you have to site mull them. So it's almost better to just swap and make it two units and find a way to make the trim on the inside and the outside aesthetically pleasing than it is to, to site mall, especially with the European stuff, the stuff that we've gotten from uh, EAS or Shuko that needed to be site mold. It felt a little more challenging than the flats, you know? Right, right. And as Patrick pointed out there, the structural molds, you also have to design them to a specific design pressure. Or, and so, you know, I, the, the, the European windows, and, and I'm not, I know Russ is listening here. I'm not banging domestic windows um, because I think they do a good job there. Um, they have a bunch of Sierra Pacific windows and other Marvins, all of them. I've used them all. 
uh, and uh, but I, I don't know. It, it, sometimes it depends. I I I can go either way on that. Um, it some of most of the time it's probably dependent on the project and the aesthetics that we're working with. And the biggest change is the number of people on site to drag the windows around. Yeah, and and yes, Robert <laughs> Robert Swinborn just he he made a good comment there that you know as an architect you need to understand the capabilities. Yeah, you're right because. This window here that you're looking at, Robert, for example, this is probably on the order of, I don't know, 450, 500 pounds. And I've done lift and slide doors that probably cruise into the 700 pound um, range. And uh, like Jake's house, those those had to be 700 yeah. pounds. Weren't those like 760 or something? Yeah, I think so. The sliding panels in the, the high threes and then the other panel is uh, five feet wider than that or four yeah. feet wider than that. So. But, you know, it's, you can't it, give that to any contractor. You can't give that to any old builder and say, hey, get this around back of the house and install it and keep it from leaking because it's going to be broken and then it's going to leak once they do get the replacement. Yeah. Like there's there is a level of care with flangeless windows that that doesn't exist in, to quite the same level with a, a flange window, too. Yeah. Steve, I think at the top of your screen is probably a red button that says stop sharing. Oh, yeah. Sorry, bud. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's okay. Um, so a, uh, <laughs> a uh, question that, um, what do I say this one? Uh, so so the, the, the idea of not pulling, fully sealing the windows, um, I, I know, I know, I know we all know that's, 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 uh, it's a bad idea to fully seal the windows, but I do see that pretty commonly. And I even know window reps who, who, who recommend that as the way to install their windows. I, I really struggled with how to detail the air barrier transition. Like it's, it's easy enough to make the watershed. You guys talked mostly about, about the water shedding. It, it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out what to do about air sealing. Do you have a, a particular trick on how you maintain your air continuity? This air might control? actually be a good one. Uh, Brian, do you actually have uh, your photos up still? Ooh, Jake's got photos. I this is good exactly. because this is where Jake Brian's and I part ways. Oh, this is what we talked about earlier today that you already this where, this is where hey, yes. This is where Jake does stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I did post a picture today about a liquid sealant. Uh, Prosco's air dam is my preference on the inside of a flanged window. Uh, so if we're connecting our air barrier from a lot of times we're using zip sheathing, uh, almost always our, ex our air barriers on the exterior side, uh, we're looking for air sealing on the interior side, Brian, it'll be towards the end. Uh, so on a flange window, I don't mind connecting that exterior air barrier to the inside face of the window and sealing all four sides of the inside face. And then I don't, think, you I don't just, think I have that shot. Uh, you have tape, I think, at the very end, possibly. No, okay. So yeah, uh, right here. that's okay. The uh, on the flangeless windows, the uh, the thing that Steve and I or Steve alluded to that we're trying on the next one is we're going to tape the interior face for an air seal, and then we're going to three side tape the exterior face and leave that sill open. So it's all about connecting that interior sealant or that interior tape through the sill or through the jam and out to the, to the air barrier. So it just becomes a, how are we making that connection? Uh, sometimes we'll use uh, full zip inside the, the window buck so that all we have to do is detail the corners and the transition from the actual opening to the flat. Uh, sometimes we use the two by six. We're doing a house right now that the two by six is the air barrier. It's just, we, we sealed the corners and we sealed between the, the zip sheathing and the two by six. Yeah, and what, what else we're doing on that? We're doing a house right now, Jake and I together, where um, we're actually gonna oversize the um, window openings an inch and we're gonna roll the, uh, uh, what you call it? The uh, air barrier inside of it. So we're gonna take zip and, and fold it into the opening. So think of it as the air barrier now. We're, we're basically doing a, 
Dudley box, right? So instead of just sliding the box in, we're going to line the inside with 7 16 inch zip and then tape that corner. And so effectively, we've folded our air barrier into there, into the opening, and then we put the window in and we have something to seal to that then comes out and around the opening. I don't think I've heard the term Dudley box before. What is that? Where does that come from? Go look it up. Google it. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> It's written extensively about in uh, GBA and fine home building, Jake. I'll yeah, see it falls, in the, it back falls in the category of only only two details that I know of: the Dudley box for window installations and the Bonfig wall that are <laughs> that are actually that have become known by the authors' names of the stories. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Dudley was the last name of the. So so we're gonna leave it as Jake will never know. <laughs> Armando, why would anybody use flangeless windows? All I can say is try it. You'll like it. Yeah. I My very first time we ever put it in, I can't even remember what was the first project where we put it in. Might have been Dan Royce. Um, and I was scared shitless. And after that, I was like, I don't know if I would ever want to go back to a flange window. I Don't know think it, of it I, as a, a flangeless window either. Yeah, I it, know it, I'm putting it's the tape counterintuitive. On I know it's counterintuitive, but... There's something really nice about the flangeless window and the ability to put it anywhere in the wall, treat it however. That that flange, it, Armando, that flange can create as many problems, if not more problems, than it solves from a water management perspective. I think Jake wanted to rebrand it as a flexible flange yes. with this tape. Isn't that what you were pushing <laughs> for? This is my yeah. flex flange window? Yeah, and if we're gonna make an argument for flanged windows, then let's talk about the manufacturers that split them at the corner that are, they're not <laughs> continuous. And let's talk about the manufacturer that thinks the one that you slam in with a hammer is now watertight. And then you're supposed to, and then that overlap is what's supposed to take care of it. So you're not getting your water tightness from that flange. You're getting your water tightness from a good connection. And I can provide a good connection with the tape. And, and, Given my experience at Building Science Corporation, what, what I can leave you with on that, very rarely in, in, in seeing literally hundreds of windows failures, would I ever sit there and say, well, that was because it was a flange window or that was a flangeless window. It was always because the person that installed it had no clue and had no right to be installing the window. So it doesn't really matter what the window is. You just need to apply the right solution to that type of window. I like, I like it. that, Travis, huh? I do. I like it. I also and like my Joel, Joel just said, is this only for high performance uh, with the flangeless or could this be a remodel style too? And I think you answered his question while you were giving that, that answer. If, if, if you detail it correctly, yeah. If yeah, you're doesn't. paying attention. And it's the same if you're doing a, a renovation and you're putting in, you know, those windows. All, all the rules apply. The down and out applies, sealing the window. It's, it's there. Yeah, there so uh, Doug, Doug Horgan, I think a while ago, had a, had a question for uh, replacement wi windows. Do you guys have, have feelings about those where, where you're using an, an old, old, you know, an old school wood frame that probably has no flashing or water sealing, taking out the sashes, popping in a, a, a unit. I mean, that's that's what replacement units are are up here in Maine usually. Have you guys ever do those? Or have you seen those? So when when I bought the, the company that I own now 13 years ago, the first two years, we counted, the first two years that uh, I owned the business, we did 750 replacement sashes. The yank the wood sashes out, slam the other one back in, put the screws in it, caulk it, and walk to the next one and be done in 20 minutes. And I would make the argument that that unit might be great, but you didn't change anything about how the wall is managed <laughs> or insulated or anything. And so, yeah, you have a historic house, your client's not interested in energy efficiency. They want to be able to see out and they want to be able to lift the screens up rather than have storms. Yeah, they, they probably still have their place in the industry. I don't think I can make an argument that there's not a large market there. It's just not uh, BSMP or show. 
<laughs> Jake, when you were doing those, were the were the homeowners looking for updated performance, or did they? Are there were uh, the windows? Just yes, stopped? and we thought we were giving it to them. You were. You were giving them a better air seal than the sashes that we certainly in. were. It's a significant yeah. air improvement. It's just not changing the insulation yeah. or air sealing around we it. We weren't insulating where the weights were or anything. We just you take a hammer, you flatten that pulley over, you cut the the weight off, let it drop inside the wall, you rack it in. And that's still the that the way that part of this industry still operates. That's still the standard practice. You know, that's the the uh, I won't name any company names. Uh, but that I mean, we made the part we touched great, <laughs> but we didn't get to touch all of it, so it doesn't matter. But it does matter for the the client that can't afford to reside yeah. their house, so that you can integrate yeah. a proper WRB, and they just want their window to not leak anymore. So yeah, or it does open. have its place. It's just not, as you pointed out, probably not so much for this crowd. It's it's a budget situation. Yeah. But, we, but I will I just tell you, I can house, do it in twenty I, minutes. Yeah, we're doing a, we're doing a house right now that is a whole house renovation. The four windows we put on the front they measure probably about nine foot long, four foot tall, three bedrooms and a garage, and we used European windows and we were able to do a and it's it's brick veneer, so we only had that one inch to work with, and we actually did the sill out of a lead coated copper and dropped it down in over the building paper and brought it up and folded over the sill. And um, we actually built in a little buck there all around the window. So we had something to tie everything to. So the window got a little bit smaller and then we basically just trimmed out the window inside with brick molding. But there's, there's ways to do it. And actually the flangeless window there worked. We, we wouldn't have been able to do that with a flange window. So it worked really well um, from, from that regard. Hey, Armando, type in what your go-to window is so I can beat up on you some more. So please. Someone, asked about, say, um, please. someone please. asked about using spray foam in the, in the shim space. And I know that a lot of people it, it, have you know have that that was very common for a long time and now fewer and fewer high performance builders are using it so i wonder if you guys could address if you use it and if not why we use it we still are a fan uh i think that uh travis will attest i have uh, a project manager that works for me that is in charge of all of this actually brian can attest too that we were shooting a fine home building article on this and i wasn't the one going "Ooh, take my picture i want to put this piece of tape on I was going, yeah, they're way better at this than I am. And they, we, we try to fill just the interior side so that there's uh, a void, there's a drainage cavity uh, for any incidental moisture that does get in there. But uh, I know that there's a big argument about, oh, it's friable, it's gonna be bad for the environment if you use it and all those sorts of things. I also think it's probably uh, the best product for that spot, uh, the way we're installing windows. Yeah, and I, and I'll, I it's, it's killing me, but I agree with Jake. I get it all the time. People, people say, why are you using, you're just using expanding foam there? Yeah, it works. And if you don't think it works, that's fine. Use whatever you want. But I have a dozen houses under 0.4. They all have foam around the windows. So it works for me. I don't, I, the, the boots don't make the cowboy there. Yeah, well, it just, we, I mean, you, you you could fully foam all the windows in a house with a case of, of canned foam or less. So like, it, it's a matter of, of, of where's your best bang for the buck. That's standard practice. You don't need to change, 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 change practices. Yeah, there are low car, lower carbon ways of doing it. And somebody should really come out with, uh, with a can, with, with a one part foam with a better blowing agent. But it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's not a low hanging fruit sort of thing. It's if you're trying to go save those last few, few few uh, pounds of carbon emission but that's that's one way you can do it and i know I, i'm sure you guys have seen the the european kind of expanding tape which is absolutely gorgeous stuff and was made to be used on masonry buildings but it's four dollars a linear foot yep so do the math on a window there right and and if you're using the the twist in clamps on the european windows it fails wherever the clamp is because you're pinching it so it, you know, the spray foam, like, like you said, yes. And ours, 
we put that in the scope of work for the insulator on most of our projects. So he has his guy come through with that fine tuned needle and can put it exactly where we need it. So, and it, and it works well. And Armando, you said Sierra Pacific, just cause you know, I won't beat you up for that. <laughs> smooth move, Armando, smooth move. I think that expanding phone tape could work. I, I think that it needs a uh, longer workability and less costs because we tried it once. I had a sample and we tried it on one window and it was like, oh, you have to, you have to put the sill in first and then you have to set a two by four with a can of paint on it, on that to keep that mush down while you do the sides and the head. Otherwise you can't get the window in there. So it can be very challenging. I think it would be a really good product if it expanded slowly and it was 30 cents a foot. It does. I mean, it does expand slowly. I, so I had the opportunity actually to go to the, the factory in Germany where they make this stuff. And um, they, they had an awesome display, but the, the guy had it out there. It's, it's like it starts at maybe a quarter of an inch and it was probably an inch and a half the next day. It's a, it's a slow move and, and they use it there, but they use it there because most of their windows are masonry. And one of the coolest things I've ever seen, and you know, it, it's unfortunate that you know we're we're limited in time, but this is my pitch to come back. Um, they, in Europe, they actually build masonry buildings and then put eight inches of EPS on the outside and stucco them. But I've I've seen windows installed out there that hang out in front of the masonry wall. They actually make brackets, so the window is in the plane of the foam. And it costs about 20% more, according to the window guy I was with. But you want to talk about freaky is I went to this project, it was under construction, and all the windows were hanging six inches in front of the wall. And then they bring the EPS around them and seal the seal it up. So it was it was a really cool detail. From a building science perspective, it was awesome because that's right where the window wants to be. But yeah, cool. Cool yeah. I've, 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 I've also heard, heard that um, if, the, if, if, if your construction gap between the window frame and the jam is, is small, like a quarter inch to three eighths, and if you're fully air sealed on the front and on the inside and outside, so there's no airflow, that it's actually too narrow a space to get convective currents, just like window, window panes are, are, you know, three eighths to half an inch. Thick because it's 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 a it's a magic size where air currents yep. can't can't happen. I don't have confirmation of, of that, but are, are we wasting time with even doing foam at all if we're if we're if we're taping the inside and outside? Is this foam just a waste? I mean, I I think it, it, it so that's one of those it depends questions, right? If if you ask right. me, and and I won't use Jake as an example because you guys would know it would favor him, but. I, I, I'll throw a bone to, to Dan Colbert and Ben. If I was working on a project with them and they said, hey, Steve, let's take the foam out of here, then I would probably not hesitate to say, sure, fine. But if it's a builder that I'm working with the first time, I don't think I would trust them. I think that's a, that's a scope of work that needs to have some trust behind it and, and a relationship behind it for me to trust it. Yeah, that makes sense. So I've been uh, having this conversation periodically with Jake and I, although he doesn't remember it, I'll, I'll bring it up now again. So the, the can foam around the interior, I think is pretty well replaced with Baccarat and caulking. And I think that that transition to the air barrier there, provided you're using a good sealant and you have centered the window well in the proper sized rough opening can perform as well or better than a tape Although I don't have any of the experience with the fancy tapes that Jake does. I have to buy all my tapes, so I don't buy them. <laughs> Ouch. Ooh. I had to hit you with a low blow, man. Wow. You forgot our conversation. So in, in your air dam post, that's what I was calling you about this morning. I'm still pretty adamant that it, you don't need this expanding foam if you have clearance in that cavity. I understand that you guys are using the twist clips on the European windows. That's not my bailiwick, you guys got me there. But if you have the clearance in the cavity and it's a fairly uniform size, your backer rod kind of solves that. And then a quality sealant, you're 
pretty solid, man. Uh, prove me wrong, Steve. Chew me out. Or Jake, no, yeah, I mean, like, we loaded well, it some morning. Let's go. All these details come down to the it's it's the execution. You, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard me say it. People ask me all the time, <laughs> "What's the right material for this?" I say the one that's installed right. That's my answer to every question on material: the one installed right, because I can make house wrap felt paper. So here's an example: we're in Vegas when we're doing that building uh, the water testing. And Vegas, as you know, they don't even use sheathing. They put up building paper on the outside of their studs, and then they stucco over it. And they use metal straps for shear. So there's no, no plywood, no OSB, nothing out there on those houses. So we had some time, and I looked at Nathan, and I said, hey, let's have some fun. Let's see if we can install a window just using felt paper. No tape, no adhesive, nothing. And we installed the window, we folded it, stapled it off, and then we put, you know, we shingle layered it, and then we put hard water on it. It wasn't under a blower door, so if, if Steve Demetric is listening, don't come at me with the blower door um, thing. It was just, we had our spray rack, we threw water at it for the good 30 minutes. Water never made it to the inside. Now, as we peeled the felt paper back, water made it about halfway through the system. And it was made to be drained and have that water come out of the system. But it's just evidence that if you think it through and, and the execution is done properly, we don't even necessarily need all these tapes and everything that we need because I did it without tapes. So it, it boils down to execution. And, and the one thing I'll tell you about European Windows Armando, that until you try it, I've probably worked with at least 15 different builders on European windows and every one of them had exactly the same comment. They are the easiest windows to work with once you get over the weight because they're true, they're square, they don't, you cannot rack a European window. It's just they're too stiff. So they go in really nice, but you have to deal with the weight. Yeah, when we did uh, the 14 foot uh, lift and slides at my house, uh, we used the Bobcat to get them around back. We set them in the opening and they were both dead on. They're dead square still. It was like, that's a eight foot tall window that's 14 foot long and it stayed square in shipping across the ocean and then riding on a Bobcat. So don't, don't listen, Patrick. I guess I moved to your windows with the Bobcat. <laughs> well, and the, I mean, um, you guys guys use the ter term European windows. It's, it's it's a tilt turn usually. It is a tilt turn. Yeah, type, I shouldn't say European, type, but yes. there are there, there are a few North American yeah. you know, you know, yeah. manufacturers. Um, do you guys know of any? I may have asked you this this before. Um, um, a lot of my clients have pretty traditional taste, like it's a stretch to get them to go from double hungs to casements and awnings, the idea of a big fat window that swings in just kind of kind of confuses everybody. Uh, uh, do you know of any European style windows that actually swing out like a casement or awning? Or are, are they all tilt, turn, and swing? You know, so this isn't really an installation. This is, this is more just a question I have. <laughs> I haven't done them, but uh, I bet you Patrick could answer that question. I, I can't imagine that. Yeah, Patrick would be the one that we'll just, he's, he's listening. He'll throw out okay. an answer here to us in about yeah. two seconds. Thank you. Uh, I know they make French casements where there's an active and passive panel. So you lock the active against the passive and you can open up the whole opening. So the mold goes with it. Um, but I'm not sure on if I've ever seen, I can't imagine they can't make it right. Yeah. Because it's, it's all it is, is a, it, you know, a, a tilt turn uh, window is just a small door in their eyes. Right. And they can do outswing systems that are turned i don't think they tilt but I, i'm sure they do it oh. hey bill the bill's coming up <laughs> there's bill can you, you there no, i'm not talking can't to him. See him or hear him but he's there <laughs> i don't talk to anybody from new orleans or anybody that's at a covid party it looks like <laughs> what's up william just he's muted I, yeah. I think i can unmute you Oh, 
So there you much. go. Okay, am I not muted now, huh? You're not muted Correct. now, so don't say those bad things you said about Jake earlier. I won't Easy. say those things I was thinking, huh? There you go. <laughs> Hello, hey, William. What's his background? Oh, look at this. I, <laughs> okay. That must be something to do with Mardi Gras, or the Mardi Gras we missed. There you go. So Doug, Doug recommended we get you up here to talk about some testing you've done. Well, yeah, and, and he, he referenced it to 2112 because I'm a big 2112-er, but this was some – E1105 stuff we did last year with WDMA and a bunch of other groups uh, it was to create some guides for installing window replacements in brick veneer clad buildings without taking apart the brick. And it gave me a good chance to see how those uh, uh, 1105 tests go. And, and my big, there were a lot of stuff that we learned out of that. And there was a little article in JLC that showed up about that. But my biggest takeaway on that replacement was two things. One, isolate the opening, which I think we're talking about anyway. That's all you can do, like what Jake was talking about. All you can do is isolate the opening so your window doesn't leak. But the other thing that I saw in the tests was that uh, the seal, the inside seal, which I prefer backer rod and a high solids content caulk, uh, was the key component to making those windows not leak. Bill, uh, Bob Swinburne asked, asked earlier a question that relates to that. Do, do you have a particular caulking you I recommend? <laughs> sure, I, I can. You know, I want to be careful where this might go out. But how about if I say a cilial terminated polyether? Will that work? Sure. The, 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 the MS polymers, the hybrid stuff, it's part silicone, part polyurethane and part no, calcium carbonate probably. But any one of those high solid contents ones, I'm, I'm a big kind of a fanatic on caulks as well, you know, using the high solid contents. And uh, so that DAP, OSI, uh, Tight Bond makes a really great one. In fact, I will say it, I think Tight Bond makes the best one I've run across. I like that the best. Uh, nearly everybody's making one now, the STPEs. STPEs. STP, cilial terminated polyether. Oh, sure. Kurt, Just come on with your Travis, fancy that your acronyms. Now? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I, you know, and I, you know, I just did another little article for JLC about selecting caulks and sealants. Uh, and from my perspective, and I put them in a hierarchy of water-based solvent-based polyurethanes, silicones, and the hybrid STPEs. And my preference is for exterior stuff, those, because they don't shrink, they'll stick to everything, they're UV resistant, paintable. Uh, what else do you want? And you should go to Bill's Instagram, 505, 504 historic windows, and what else, Bill? And Bandana Bill. Bandana Bill. Yeah, I got both of them. <laughs> I try to co-post on both of them at the same. Thanks, Jake. That's yeah, buddy. Hey, Lillian had a question about using sheep's wool or something for inside the window. I think she was suggesting that that's a um, that's a low carbon option using uh, using sheep's wool insulation in the shim space and then using tapes, vapor open tapes as your air seal. Right. I don't think I can fit a sheep in the rough opening around uh -huh. the when uh, But I would think I don't. It, it, to me, that's almost like saying let's put bad insulation in there. Wouldn't sheep's wool be air permeable? I mean, what's what's the benefit, I guess? I guess if you seal it in between outside tape and inside tape, then it's arguably a cavity. So there is some R value there, but I, I don't know. I think we're splitting hairs there. Well, I guess that's a, yeah. And one, I mean, that's maybe, maybe she's thinking and maybe, maybe, you know, other people too are try, trying to get some R value in that space, thinking that, you know, whatever else they're doing is just for air sealing and they want to get insulation in there. So that, I guess that's a good question. Is there any, is there value in trying to get an insulating factor in that shim space? So I think, I, I think that the concentration should be on air there. And so when we, when we talk about control layers, thermal is number four on my list, right? Water, air, vapor, um, thermal. And I think by pressing the idea of, hey, can we get our value in here? We might be at a disadvantage where we lose sight of what's important as far as water management and the air leakage. And the air leakage part, what I mean is for something to leak, obviously we need water, we need a hole, 
and we need a pressure difference. And the water, I'm not going to stop because Mother Nature exists. Um, I could stop it from probably getting in that cavity somewhat. Um, the um, pressure difference, I have a really good chance there that if I can make it an airtight window installation and I don't have that pressure difference against there, if water does exist, I can't push it through the hole, right? So I, I would concentrate on, on, you know, being airtight long before I'm thermally proficient. And that's, that's true of a building in general to me. Our, our value, I, you know, I sit there and I show slides. Yes, our 40 walls, 70 walls, 120 roofs and stuff. But it's the last thing on my list. Insulation is a financial equation for me. How much can you afford? And let's put it in the roof first, the wall second, basement last. It's I also might think about sticking a uh, backer rod in there before I started putting, uh, you know, fiberglass or anything else in there. Backer rod cuts down on quite a bit of air movement and I'm sure provides some level of R value, although I don't know if they rate it that way or not. I've been talking to a bunch of people about windows over the last couple of weeks for a, a few different um, a few different things, including the show and an article that's going to be on GBA tomorrow. But I, I was surprised how how often the people's comment was that they they don't think really think about windows in terms of thermal performance. They think about them in terms of comfort, and and that and that that that, that should that that's really what's driving their decisions on windows. And you know th when they when they think about um, occupant comfort, it's leading them to better thermal performance, but when they put occupant comfort first, um, they ch changes their decisions just a little bit and, um, and actually asks them to have higher uh, performance specs than if they were just thinking about energy efficiency, for example. Yeah. I mean, the window is always going to be the worst part of the wall. It always is, yeah. right? If you're building a wall that's less than the window, we're in big trouble. But I mean, for, for all my Texas people out there on the chat, even in Texas, the wind, the, the wall is better than the window, right? So I got to pick that a fight with somebody, Travis. It's Texas. Continued conversation about comfort, though, Brian, that the conversation that I was talking about with Peter, we said, okay, well, if we're going to keep those blinds from frying the sills, are we venting top and bottom then? And he said, well, it kind of eliminates the purpose of the blinds. And I said, well, you put the blinds up there for, for, the, for the fact that you want the sun to not hit you as well. Like you, you're... It serves two purposes, so we're still talking about comfort. We're just talking about it in a in a different way. And I think that there's, you know, that comfort argument is the one that people forget to acknowledge sometimes too. Though. Yeah, and and people don't understand the whole the heat loss mechanism, surface temperature, all of that. Because I get a lot of clients that, are, oh yeah, we gotta we gotta swap out these windows because these windows are really drafty. No, they're not drafty. They're just really cold in the winter and guess who becomes the radiator yeah or they could be really poorly installed or they could be poorly installed but patrick makes a point that uh, uh most of our retrofit installations the window is better than the wall i am putting windows in my new house that have a higher r value than the house that i'm sitting in right now so <laughs> there you go my house has R7 fiberglass in the walls, and it only has fiberglass in the bathrooms and the kitchen. So uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was holding this one towards the end just in case we had uh, more questions, but uh, uh, Steve Demetric's point about negative pressure, I actually do have a horror story myself about the negative pressure. So just I, I wanted to sort of tell my story and see if you guys have uh, have input. You know, Steve, Steve was, I think, commenting maybe a, maybe Jake posted on Instagram. Just I I lost tr track yes. today, but yeah, yeah, Jake Jake posted <laughs> about you guys spraying water water at windows. This was going back ten or fifteen years when I was starting when I was when I was getting out of carpentry into design. I didn't fully know what I was doing. Uh, I designed a house on a coastal bluff that faces the open ocean on one side it's 80 feet above the ocean on the other side is a cove it happens to be the cove where where Maine's first shark fatality uh, happened a couple of days ago but so what happens is the 
the wind comes off the open ocean, you know, it's open to Antarctica, comes up, up over this 80 foot bluff, then back down to the cove. So on a perfectly calm day, it, it's, it's basically, basically operating like an airplane wing. So the wind is blowing around this bluff, but when it goes up and over it, it has to accelerate, just, just like wind accelerates over a bluff, uh, I mean, over, over an, an airplane wing. So on a perfectly calm day, there was a 30 mile an hour wind. On a windy day, it was a 50 or 60 mile an hour wind. I, I spec'd the highest DP windows I could find. I think we had, um, it was uh, some DP 30, or no, DP 40 double hungs and, um, and some DP 50 casements and awnings installed with the best details I could think of. We didn't do a rain screen, it was pretty, pretty early in rain screen days, but, uh, and the budget was tight, of course, but you know, we did everything right we could. We, could. we did an aluminum sill pan because, because we wanted, if the windows leak, leak, we wanted them to drain. So what happened is the windows, like a lot of windows, or, or and I know this is an unusual uh, 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 situation, most locations are not this punishing, but there are locations that are this, this punishing. So what happens is most windows are designed to be self-draining. So they take on water, there's a certain sort of built-in back dam, and they drain out again. Uh, uh, no, no, Russ, it wasn't you, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but basically the self-draining mechanism wouldn't work because the wind was always countering it. And so the water, we could watch the water come right up in and over the whole mechanism. And uh, so the way Steve Demetric, it, well, it, it, this was a, was a reasonably tight house for the time. It was uh, point, blew at uh, 1.7 ACH 50, it was a flash and bat house. Um, so it, it wasn't super tight, but it was, it was, it was better than code for sure. Um, we ended up tearing off all the siding, adding a rain screen, doing some funky stuff, but it ended up being the solution was to tape all the windows shut. Uh, and so Steve Demetric's approach is to do multiple blower door tests throughout construction to make sure that he is addressing this at, at every point along the way. I didn't know if you guys um, have any tips or tricks or approaches, or do, or do you think that that's an unusual enough situation that it's not worth worrying about? Uh, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's my story. I think it's somewhat <laughs> unique, Mike. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when, when I do, when we do houses and when we do them with Jake, it, um, and even in other builders, I typically do blower doors in both directions, positive and negative, because we yeah. want to understand how well the windows are performing. Right. If I if I do a positive test and it's a tilt turn, I'm pushing the window against the weather stripping. So the windows, even if they were bad, they're going to perform pretty good. But when I turn the fan around and try and suck the window away from the weather stripping, that's when it needs to perform at its best, especially in the condition that you described. Right. That. Um, so, I mean, testing on both ways. I'm a big fan when I did my addition on my own house the builder the day after the builder put it I had a ladder on every window I put the garden hose on every one and we found like two or three that leaked god I bet your builder hates you yes he does <laughs> so as soon as you so. came walking with a garden hose and a ladder he was probably just like let's go pack it up let's guys go. let's go uh, hey somebody asked a couple uh Chris Chan I know he's a, a big fan of this he was asking about high performance spacers I don't, it, I don't quite know what he's talking about. Does anybody? The plastic know? instead of wood? Are no, they like the little U-shaped shims for windows? He was talking about the glazing units because he said he couldn't get high performance oh. in his area. So I think he was asking about the glazing units and, you know, the warm edge spacers versus the common, more common aluminum construction. That was volume one. That was in volume one. We, we, yeah. we have to go back to GBA and rewatch. Yeah. You know what I always find pretty interesting? We're talking about windows. Um, and I, I get this a fair amount talking with other architects or builders. And they'll say, you know, we'll get into a conversation about windows. And they say, well, I always use X brand. And I said, oh, wow, that's cool. Well, why? Oh, they're, they're much better than the other brands. When the reality is, is Cardinal Glass pretty much makes glass for all mm -hmm. the windows. Right. So depending on who you're using now, granted, I know Russ is going to come on here and tell me, well, you can put a different film on a different surface and you can change the parameters and performance of the windows by that. I get it, but you're still getting pretty much, you can get the same glazing package in almost any domestic carrier 
by choosing that. Don't, and, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but don't fall under the myth that X window is better than Y window because it's this brand. Because low E double glazed from one <clears throat> is probably almost the same unit as low E double glazed from the other. So, I don't know, just something to throw out. Yeah. Uh, well, guys, we're coming up on our uh, time. Do you want to uh, maybe send, send our audience away with, with your one, one uh, golden tip for installing windows that people may not have, be, may not be commonly used to using? What's, what's your best trick? Pay better attention. <laughs> My, mine's going to be more general than just windows, Mike. I'm, I'm going to say, you know, I tell people when you use sealants and caulks, the first question to ask yourself is ask yourself what you're sealing in, not what you're sealing out. Because in my history of looking at building failures, most of the time the failures were because water couldn't get out once it got in. And so there, there's a reason we call it water management and not a water barrier. Um, you know, you, you have to be careful and make sure that if water does get behind this tape or this sealant, how does it get out? And you need to answer that question because chances are Mother Nature will, will put it to the test. Excellent. Well, th thank you so much, Steve and Jake and my co-hosts and our audience for uh, participating tonight and anybody who watches this in the future. Have a great night. Great. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being on, guys.